as a practicing periodontist, I know that one of my busy, biggest expenses used to be taxes. And if you're watching or listening to this, you probably have felt the same thing as well. Good news. We have a couple of gentlemen on the show today that could help us with that little nasty thing that we have to send to the IRS every year, and that is taxes. So I want to welcome a couple of gentlemen to the show, and they are the also known as the real estate, C, they, they are at the real estate CPA.com. Let you guys introduce yourselves and uh, we'll get going. Thanks for having us on. My name is Brandon. I'm the managing partner at the firm. Uh, we are a national firm. So we've got six, 700 clients across the United States at this point, fully niched in real estate. Um, you know, our clients are in like, they do all sorts of different things, but the one commonality is real estate. Um, all of our staff are virtual, so we're, we're, we are a remote firm. We all work out of our homes. We've got about 40 staff onshore, about 10 offshore. Uh, but yeah, we've, we started in 2016, so we've been doing this for a while now. And it's been a lot of fun working with real estate investors and, and watching our clients grow and you know, get into the multi-million dollar portfolio sizes. So it's been a, been a real blast. And, and Tom, my partner, is here as well, and I'll let him introduce himself. Yeah. So my name is Thomas Castelli. I'm a CPA, certified financial planner, I'm a partner at, at the, you know, at the firm. And uh, I've had the privilege of working with, with lots of clients on tax strategy and planning and helping them save a lot of money in taxes. So, you know, I'm excited to be here. Happy to share uh, my knowledge here today with, with, with your, uh, with your listeners. So I'm a member of a couple of private Facebook groups that are for phys physicians and dentists specifically for real estate. And shortly before I started this, I asked them, is there, I'm, I told them I'm going to be interviewing you guys. And I said, and I'm, and I'm looking over here at my other screen. And I said, is there any specific questions that y'all would like me to ask the real estate CPA guys? And they, uh, kind of the consensus is there's mainly two. And the first one is regarding, you know, everybody wants to get into real estate with taxes. <clears throat> Number one, as a practicing, full-time practicing professional, is it realistic to really be able to get into real estate? That's number one. And number two, is it possible to lower taxes to almost zero? And, and I know a lot of them are talking about real estate professional status. That's kind of thrown around a little bit. And uh, so maybe maybe we can start with 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 that. Maybe what is you know real estate professional status? How do you qualify? We'll just kind of go from there. Sure, sure. So I'll take number one. Maybe Tom, you can take number two if that works. Or you know, I just jump in while I'm going. We've done this. All right. Right, sorry. Was, <laughs> very, was, very informal here. The, the, I'll, I'll, I'll do the first one. All right. So, so when, okay. So what we're talking about are the passive activity loss rules. Um, the rules were implemented in 1986 and they were implemented in 1986 because Congress was looking at high income earners, such as physicians, and they were seeing physicians buy rental real estate and offset their regular W2 income with rental losses. Right. And so Congress implements Section 469, which are the passive activity loss rules to effectively stop physicians from using what Congress called a tax shelter, rental real estate producing tax losses while simultaneously producing cash flow. That's the beautiful thing about real estate, right? I can buy a home, a single family home, rent it, cash flow 10 grand a year, but tell the IRS I lost 15 um, because of depreciation, because of that, that, that variance. Depreciation is a, non-cash expense. So it's an expense I get to claim every single year, but I don't have to physically pay for it every single year. It just tracks the deterioration of my asset over time, the one that I bought years ago. Uh, and I get to claim that expense every single year. So physicians and high income earners were doing this a lot pre-1986. Congress implements the passive activity loss rules to effectively stop it in 1986. Uh, and then in 1993-94, they implement real estate professional status because what was happening was in 1986, when they implemented the passive activity loss rules, rental real estate became a passive activity. And all of our W-2 jobs, our business income, that's all a non-passive activity. And 
if you have a passive loss from rental real estate, it cannot offset non-passive income. That's what the passive activity loss rules did. So created two buckets of income, passive, non-passive, but the passive losses from my rentals were trapped in that passive bucket. You couldn't jump them out and offset the non-passive losses unless you met one of the exceptions. Well, people that were in real estate full-time, like think about a builder, developer, a real estate agent, broker, they were, they, they're in real estate full-time. They're also buying rentals. And what was happening was they were saying, Hey, I've got rental losses, real estate losses that can't offset my real estate income. That's not fair because the, the physician can use medical equipment losses to offset their physician income. That's not fair. So that's where real estate professional status came into play. So real estate professional status is 1993, 1994 came into play as another exception to the passive activity loss rules. And mm -hmm. if you qualify as a real estate professional, it allows you to jump your passive losses, your rental passive losses out of the passive bucket and make them non-passive losses. And that is beneficial because if I have non-passive income, such as my W-2 job, my business income, and I also have non-passive losses from rental real estate, now those two offset each other, right? So I can use my non-passive rental losses to offset my non-passive income, other income, non-real estate income. But if, if, I, if I don't qualify for an exception, if I don't qualify for real estate professional status, then my rental losses are passive. They get stuck in that passive bucket and any losses that are in excess of passive income simply become suspended and carry forward. So real estate professional status, the first thing that we like to tell people is that it was implemented for people that were in real estate full-time already. It was not implemented for somebody working a W-2 job full-time that wanted a, a quote, you know, loophole. Um, that's not what it is. It, it's an exception for people that are already in real estate full-time. And so if to answer your first question, I'm a physician, I'm working full-time. Is it possible or realistic to qualify as a real estate professional? Now, I like to joke that I'm an optimist. So I, you know, I've seen how hard I work. <laughs> I've seen how hard physicians work. I've seen how hard uh, stockbrokers work and bankers work. You can put in some pretty significant hours, right? So do I believe that you could work 40 hours a week in your physician job and an additional 41 hours a week in real estate to qualify as a real estate professional? Yes, I believe that you could do that. Will the IRS or tax court believe that you could do that? The answer is no, they will not. Um, not a single person working a full-time job has ever qualified successfully as a real estate professional once audited and taken to tax court. So is it realistic? I guess it depends on what your term of realistic me, what your definition means, right? Like, could you do it? Yeah, you could do it. Right. Will the IRS or tax court believe it? They're not going to believe it. Um, so I hope that answers that question. But to qualify as a real estate professional, there's two tests. You have to spend 750 hours in a real property trader business or multiple real property trader businesses. <clears throat> and you have to spend more time in those real property trades or businesses than you do anywhere else. That's why I said you can work 40 hours a week as a physician, but you also have to work an additional 41 hours a week in real estate. So you're working an 81 hour work week every single week. Uh, it's going to be in, in the, the IRS's mind, impossible to do. Yeah. Cause I, I talk a lot about real estate syndications. So a couple of things, people come to me and they think, okay, I'm going to invest in a real estate syndication and then I can take, and the question is, can I take that depreciation, that bonus depreciation or accelerated depreciation or whatever, and offset my active income? That's, that's their mentality. And what, from what you're saying is that is not the case, correct? Correct. Yeah. Okay. And so then the other thing is, Many times it'll be a, like a full-time physician or dentist. Um, they will have a non-working spouse, maybe get like a realtor's license or something like that. And, but they still think all they're going to do is invest in syndications, but then have her or him on the side that has a realtor's license 
and they think that that could possibly qualify that's not the case correct right right so so becoming simply becoming a real estate agent will qualify you as a real estate professional it'll give you that checkbox on your tax return however you still have to materially participate in your rental activities and when you invest as a limited partner by default uh, you're not materially participating so unfortunately if you're just you know if you're just investing in real estate syndications despite the fact that you are a real estate professional by being an agent uh, mm -hmm. you won't be able to take the losses as non-passive from your limited partnership investments. You need to have what you would need to have to do this. And you could do it is you need to have your own rental portfolio that you do materially participate in. And, you know, there's, there's seven material participation tests. I'm sure we could break that down um, if, if you like, but self-manage is a good way to summarize it. Um, you would need to self-manage that, that portfolio. You would need to spend more than 500 hours on your own portfolio, then you can group in your limited partnership syndications in with those investments. But the key to this is the key is you need to have your own portfolio that you basically self-manage and then you can group it in. That's kind of the, the, the crux of it. How it works. Well, and, so and if, I do want to clarify the, the agent thing that you mentioned, Tom, because I think that that is a point of confusion for people simply getting your real estate license will not qualify you as a real estate professional. You, you might be, you might be able to say I'm a real estate professional on LinkedIn, but the IRS says, or, or the internal revenue code says uh, you must spend 750 hours right. in real property trades or businesses. And you must spend more time in those real property trades or businesses than you do anywhere else. So even though I have a real estate license, that doesn't mean that I'm an IRS, so to speak, uh, real estate professional status person. Uh, I, I still have to spend 750 hours brokering real property um, and more time brokering real property than I do anywhere else. So I do want to clarify that because we get people every once in a while that's, that will say, well, my wife got a, a license, so we're good. Well, no, actually you're not. You have to still spend the time. You got to make sure you meet those two quantitative tests. Yeah, and that's because, because you, know, you did talk a little bit about materially participating. Can you just maybe briefly break that down? What that means for the listeners? Yeah. So basically, uh, materially participating is the the act of actively being involved in the business. And there's seven tests, like I mentioned, but there's really only three tests that typically matter to to most taxpayers. And that is one: you spend 500 hours or more than 500 hours on the activity. That's if you do if you do that, good. Uh, the second one is you do substantially everything, which effectively means you're a one person show. You might have some people help out in, in minor ways, but you're, you're, you're largely doing the operation yourself. Right. And then the third one is you're spending more than a hundred hours on the activity and no one other individual is spending more time than you. And if you're able to meet one of those tests or some of the other ones, but again, these are the three tests that are generally most relevant. Uh, if you meet one of these tests, then you will be considered to be materially participating. Now, Again, just to clarify for what Brandon's saying before with the real estate agent, you can be a real estate agent, meet that 750 hour requirement, say being an agent, say you're a full-time agent, right? Mm -hmm. Say the spouse is a full-time agent. Uh, so they, they meet that checkbox. Well, um, that does not mean they automatically materially participated in their rental activities. They still need to meet one of these three tests on their own rental activities in order to take the losses as non-passive. Um, again, well, in a, or in other words, against their W-2 or active business income. Yeah. So there's like two hurdles, right? There's the real estate professional status hurdle, and then there's the material participation hurdle. And those could be knocked down simultaneously, meaning that I'm a landlord and I'm a real estate agent. So maybe I'm a landlord for 500 hours and I'm a real estate agent for 250 hours. So combined, I have 750 hours and maybe that's all I do. I don't mm -hmm. do anything else. So I also meet the more time in real estate than anywhere else. So between those two, I'm good. So I'm a real estate agent and I've knocked down, or I'm, I'm a real estate professional and I knocked down material participation kind of on my way to being a real estate professional. But it could also be achieved completely separately. Like I could just be a real estate agent for a thousand hours. And then I have to remind myself to go back and materially participate in my rentals on top of that. So, um, it's, it's like this thing, it's this kind of like weird dichotomy where you can knock them down both at the same time, or you hit one and then hit the other. Of those seven 
tests, material, materially participating tests, in your opinion, which one of the seven would be the easiest for a full-time professional to get or acquire to achieve? The easiest would be substantially all, but to be honest with you, I don't know that we have, we, we have what one tax court case on substantially all the lender yeah. tax court case, yeah. whichever one it, he was like Chicago moved to Florida. I forget the name mm -hmm. of it. Is that, is that the one? I'm not sure the exact tax okay. court case on it, but the issue with the issue with the substantially all tests though, is that it's, it's not, it's not very objective, right? Um, it's, it's somewhat subjective in the sense that, well, well, here, here's what the issue comes down to. Let me back this up. So in many cases, what happens is the IRS or tax court, they might not respect it unless you're working a hundred hours. It becomes a lot more harder to substantiate that position unless you're spending at least a hundred hours on the activity, just the way the tax rules are written. So um, while it may seem the easiest when you're looking at it on paper, uh, mm -hmm. there are some traps for the unwary. So like in, in, in my opinion, uh, what I think is the easiest test to, to, to substantiate or the easiest test to get to um, is the hundred hours and no one else works more than you because it makes it very clear. You can easily document your time, say how much time you spent, right? You spent more than hundred hours, check. Um, and then the second piece of it is you wouldn't need to substantiate the time that other people spent but you still get to have other people help you, right? And if you're if you're doing other things, you're a real estate agent, say, you you, you may need that support, right, on your team to to help people actually facilitate the rental the rental business for you, right? You might not be able to have the time to do everything yourself. So that, in my opinion, in my experience, is is the one that's probably the easiest. So I live in have. Louisiana, so it so in my mind. I should go buy a rental house on about 200 acres and just spend all weekend mowing it on a tractor. Right. <laughs> I mean, That's a lot yeah, of hours. <laughs> I think technically you'd be good. So yeah. And yeah, just mow really time. slow, right. In the slow yeah. year. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and I would agree with Tom, the hundred hours in more than anyone else is the easiest to, I would say substantiate. Yeah. Um, I, I was, I was attacking your question from a, the lowest number of hours. So, I mean, you know, technically substantially all is, is a test If you. If your participation is substantially all of the participation that you are mm -hmm. materially participating. So, you know, if you think about it, it's like, if I spend 40 hours a year and nobody else does anything, then my participation is substantially all 40 hours right. divided by 40 hours, right? It's a hundred percent. But I think that to Tom's point, you'll probably have some trouble uh, defending that should you be audited and taken to court? Okay. All right. So from what I'm hearing, it, it can be done as a full-time professional, but it's tough. All right. So I don't want everybody to turn off the video or the, or the audio right now, because we have something else for them <laughs> as well, that it seems to me, the more that I've learned about it and I've, uh, just wrote an article about it recently. I'll, I'll post it uh, link below this video. It's more and more full-time people, physicians and dentists are looking towards this other strategy, short-term rental strategy to offset their active income. So could you tell us a little bit about that? And, and we'll, we'll kind of dive into that as well. Yeah. So there's, there's another way around this and it's, it's been dubbed the short-term rental loophole. Um, and the way this works is it's, it's, it was, a, the law was originally developed to kind of regulate hotels, motels, similar establishments. And again, this was put in place back in the eighties, like Brandon had mentioned earlier, these rules, these rules were set up then. And at the time, I imagine that the, 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 the Congress or whoever wrote these laws uh, did not, did not foresee Airbnb and VRBO um, <laughs> making short-term rentals, uh, you know, proof, you know, making it a phenomenon, right. Where everybody's mm -hmm. renting it in. So they probably didn't think to guard against this when it was written. That's why it's a loophole. So the way it works is if you, if you meet certain criteria, then your rental activity is not a rental activity for the purposes of the passive activity rules, which means that you do not need to qualify as a real estate professional. You only need to materially participate. So let me break that down a little bit further. So if your property has an average stay of seven days or less, then it's not a rental activity. Um, if it has an average day of 30 days or less and you provide substantial services, then it's not a rental activity. And substantial services are things that you'd find in a hotel, daily cleaning, daily meals, um, tours, you know, prepaid vouchers, 
um, you know, these types of like done for you services, these conveniences you'd find at the hotel. So if you can meet one of those two requirements, and there's a few others, but those are the two that that are mostly going to be relevant to this conversation. And then at that point, you're not a rental activity. So bye bye real estate professional status. And now you can now you can turn the losses non passive from your short term rental activities by meeting one of those three material participation tests I mentioned before. So this means you only have to do one of these three things, right? Um, you could do substantially all if, it, although that might not be the best one, um, you could do more than a hundred hours and no one else spends more than you and uh, more time than you. And this is very popular in the short-term rental space because uh, people tend to uh, like to have cleaners and sometimes an occasional handyman come down and fix the property or whatever. Uh, so this is by far the more pop most popular one in my experience with the short-term rental loophole. And then the third one is obviously you could spend more than 500 hours. If you meet any one of those tests, those losses are going to be non-passive and you don't need to be a real estate professional. So are you, are you ever seeing people maybe getting to the, the, the last quarter of the year, seeing they've got a big chunk of money they've got to pay to the IRS and then they go out, they find property, they, they get as much depreciation as they can. Or, or how are you maybe seeing the strategy used by some of these people, full-time people? I would say in general, it's just people, it's more so people know that they're just going to have this ongoing large tax bill. Mm -hmm. um, and they're just constantly looking for short-term rental properties, whether they find it in Q1 or Q4, uh, but they'll buy the short-term rental. They will outfit it. They'll, they'll get it ready to rent. They'll start renting it and they'll self-manage it. Okay. And that's the key is that self-management piece. If you hand it off to a property manager, you're kind of toast from... Uh, being able to to claim that you materially participated in the short term rental, um, but yeah, I mean it's it's we definitely get the people that do like the rush at the end of the year. You know, mm -hmm. they'll buy a rental December fifteenth and try to get it on market and rent it one week or something. We think that that is relatively high risk, uh, especially with the um, increased budget that the IRS just received. Um, so we just encourage people, you know, if you know that you're in a, a high income situation and you're going to have taxes, which it's going to be a lot of the physicians, just always keep an eye out. Don't wait till the last minute. If you find something in the middle of summer, pick it up then and self-manage it through the rest of the year. Yeah. The, the, Do, the does it matter if the, let's say you're going to Airbnb and you, and you need to spend a lot of time on it and, and this and that, does it matter if it's across the country? Or does it need to be relatively close to your area in order to, you know, have them participate in hours? It does matter, especially for, you know, perception from an auditor. Right. Um, but if you can still show that you've materially participated, like you fly out to the property, you do all the repairs, uh, you change all the fixtures, you get all the furniture, you do all the shopping, you know, you stock, you stock it with supplies, then you fly away and then you've just got your cleaning crew and linen crew turning it on a weekly basis, but you're still the one that's communicating with all the tenants. You're managing the Airbnb VRBO listings. You may still have a case for, for being able to claim material participation, even at a distance such as that. Uh, but the closer the property is to you, the, the firmer your case is going to be. Um, the IRS routinely disallows travel time under audit. So it's really important to understand that, you know, if, if I fly hours away, the travel time to and from my home and the short-term rental is not going to count towards material participation. The tax court takes this stance as well. So it agrees mm -hmm. with the IRS. Um, but this even boils down to drive time. I mean, there's a, there was a tax court case, Lucero versus commissioner 2020, 2020. Yeah, it was 2020. Um, okay. Yeah. And, and the, the short-term rentals were an hour and a half to two hours away from Lucero, the taxpayer, uh, and Lucero visited the properties six to eight times a year. And the tax court disallowed all the travel time, but the tax court was looking for, you know, what did you do on site? How did that time all add up? Ultimately Lucero lost the case. So, you know, when any, when anybody asks us that type of question, um, mm -hmm. you know, distance from my home to the short-term rental, what does that need to look like? We actually pull up and reference that Lucero case because it's a very good guide. So um, 
if you have a, let's say you have Dr. T that's working full time. He buys his wife a condo in Destin. It's five hours away. And his wife does not work. And she's the one that self-manages everything. She drives to the condo. She's doing everything. Would, but he's still working full time. She's not, but because they're married, you know, filing jointly, are they still able to use that? Or does the doctor work? Is the doctor, the one that's working full time have to do all the work for the condo? No, no, because they're married. Um, so for the purposes of the material participation test, when you're yes. married, one spouse's time counts towards material participation. Um, but it doesn't matter who a, does it. Yeah, you're basically one person. Now, I do want to clarify with this, that if we're talking about the real estate professional status, because I know we talked about that earlier. Um, if you're trying to reach that 750 hour test, uh, you one person, one spouse has to meet that test, right? Independently, one spouse has to meet that test. We're talking about material participation on these short-term rentals here or frank, or your long-term rentals. If one spouse say meets the 750 hours from being an agent, yeah. um, then that's where both time, where both spouses time will count towards it. And, and to clarify that a little bit further, because I know it's, I know what people are thinking, right? You can't really double dip, right? So say me and my spouse, I'm not married, but if I did, if I was married, say me and my spouse went to Home Depot, right? We went to Home Depot and we both went shopping for, wood or whatever for that for the property well we'd have a hard time claiming that both of our time spent in that case be, unless you know there needs to be a legitimate reason like so if you and your spouse go to a property and one person's painting the other one's putting up the ceiling fan well you know now you're both doing legitimate work but you can't really double dip but the the, the point is though that doesn't really matter which spouse does the work when it comes to material participation you're basically one person for the sake of this test so, so can you walk me through like a, the, a theoretical, let's like an example for uh, people like what, you know, maybe like a, a million dollar condo or million dollar vacation home in Florida could do to uh, uh, the typical physician making maybe three, four hundred thousand dollars a year in taxes from the short term rental loophole? Yeah, yeah. So uh, I'll, just I'll something Tom... basic, you know. Yeah, I'll let Tom actually walk through it. But what I want to say is let's let's walk through a vacation at home because the condos are typically pretty easy to manage and the IRS likes to attack those. So if you if you're you know buying condos and trying to claim material participation on that, just make sure that you work with a competent advisor who can really help you understand the risk um, and, and help you assess whether or not you actually are materially participating. But Tom, if you want to walk us through like a million home. dollar beach acquisition um yeah. and i guess we could use like just conservative on a single family yeah. home 15 20 yeah. percent something like that yeah yeah I, i'm gonna i'm gonna break this down but just understand before i say this that your property it's gonna ma vary property to property and you're gonna want to talk to your advisors about everything we're talking about here today i would i would hesitate just to tell you to go and try to implement this yourself right the only reason is because this is nuanced stuff and things do get more and more like detailed at the individual level. So having said that, if you take a million dollar beach home property, we're going to assume for the sake of, for the sake of uh, this conversation, that 80% of that purchase price is attributable to the actual building itself, right? Land is not depreciated. So land's never depreciated. And that's determined basically based on the property tax card or an independent third party appraisal. But in this example, we're going to take 80%. 80% is going to be uh, depreciated. And out of the 80%, you could generally take, say, somewhere around 20, 25% of that 80%, right? So if we're going to be, you know, for a conservative estimate here, let's say you have $800,000 is going to be the, the building's value uh, for this purpose. Is now you say 20%, you're talking about $160,000 deduction. Okay. Um, now, that's not the amount of taxes you're going to save. That's going to be the deduction. And the way that the deduction works is to kind of flesh this out a little bit. You're going to have a profit and loss statement. On your profit and loss statement, you're going to have rental income. Then you're going to have all of your expenses, your operating expenses, you're talking about repairs and maintenance, you know, um, advertising, uh, insurance, property taxes, utilities, all of that. 
and then you're going to have depreciation. So on that, you're going to have this, this big $160,000 depreciation expense, thanks to bonus depreciation. And what it's going to do is that's generally in most cases, unless your Airbnb is just booked to the max and producing substantial cash flow, which would be amazing, by the way, um, then you're going to have this tax loss. And this tax loss is going to offset your ordinary income or your, your W-2 or active business income. So does that, does that answer the question there? So, so what, yeah, it does. So what, what would that look like? Somebody making three, $400,000 a year, right. what could that potentially save them in taxes? I guess kind of just a ballpark. Right. 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 So, so the way this works, say you were making $400,000 a year and let's just say that this, let's just say that this expense after everything was accounted for, let's just say this ended up being a hundred and twenty thousand dollar loss you took because you your rental and it offset some rental income. Again, being conservative here, you're looking at only paying taxes on two hundred eighty thousand dollars of income. And uh, so, what that would mean is this hundred twenty thousand dollars. Let's just say you're in the twenty twenty four percent tax bracket, right? Okay. What we're looking at here in terms of tax saving potentially at the federal level would be twenty eight thousand eight hundred dollars you know, conservatively, if you're at the 24% tax bracket. That's each year. That's each, that's, so this would be in the first, so with bonus depreciation, the way this works is bonus depreciation, it, you take that in the first year. So you'd get this big expense in the first year, you place that property in service and you meet all these requirements we just talked about. Now, um, after the second year, you're generally only going to have your regular depreciation expense from the building. We're talking about short-term rentals. We're talking about the buildings. Be the building is going to be uh, the structural components and all that, the roof and all those type of things. That's going to be depreciated over 39 years. Um, when you're talking about residential property, so this is if you're going to be using um, the real estate professional status for residential homes, mm -hmm. um, you're talking about 27 and a half years. So each year going forward, you're going to have this little depreciation expense relative to the to the first year that's going to help you offset some of your rental income, but you're not going to have this big, this big expense every year. That's only going to be the first year you buy the property, but you can always buy another property and kind of do uh, the same thing. That's what I was going to say. It sounds like we need to buy a beach house each year, huh? <laughs> Good excuse. Yeah, I may, may not want my wife to watch this episode, get her, get her any ideas. <laughs> okay. So it sounds like, you know, we've talked about the real estate professional status and we've talked about the, the short-term rental tax loophole. It sounds like it it's more possibly attainable for the second option. Would you agree? I would, I would have to agree that it, if in most cases it's going to be the case. Okay. And uh, uh, another bit of good news is for people that maybe are hearing about this the first time they want to learn more, you guys have actually put together a very helpful course for that. Is that correct? Right, right. So we put together a course. It's about three hours long. It breaks down literally everything about the strategy from A to Z. It includes all the citations from the, IR, the internal revenue code or the regulations, the treasury regulations rather. Um, IRS publications and uh, tax court cases that support uh, the short-term rental loophole. So um, if you're really looking for a thorough um, review of the strategy and you kind of want to have better conversations with your CPA on how this could, or your tax advisor and how this could be applied, um, the, the course would be an excellent way to kind of shortcut everything and just get everything you need to know in a consolidated way. And this is like a video course or is there resources? Tell us a little bit about the format. Absolutely. So it is a video course, um, uh, about three hours long. Uh, I don't remember the exact amount of videos, but it's about three hours and okay. it just breaks everything down. Um, and then you also going to get access to, you get a 30 day trial to our insiders group. And within our insiders group, you get, um, you get, uh, access to up to four live Q and A's per month, as, as well as a forum that you can discuss, questions and then our team include myself included will answer those questions so kind of the way it works you kind of go through the course you learn everything you need to know you'll probably have some questions so then what you could do is you could sign up for a trial for the for the community and you can ask those questions either right in the forums and uh, i'll probably answer some of them and then uh the or you could just hop on a live q a and you can ask those as well so it's kind of the two ways it's kind of like you get the upfront knowledge and then you have some support as well on the back end. 
And will you, will you be able to provide us a link so I can put it below the video? Yeah, absolutely. I could, I can absolutely send you a link for it. Okay. Excellent. And um, I appreciate you doing that and sharing that with uh, the listeners. Uh, Brandon, any, any um, closing thoughts before we uh, end today? Just, uh, just be careful. Um, there are certainly tax preparers and advisors out there that really want your business. And what they will do is tell you things that you want to hear. Um, and we pride ourselves on telling clients what they need to hear to win IRS audits. So an example might be like a lot of, a lot of people want to hear that research and education time counts towards real estate professional status and material participation. However, there's plenty of history of litigation where, which shows you that that time does not count. Um, and so even if that's painful to hear, it is what you need to hear to win IRS audits, to substantiate your position as a real estate professional or, and or material participation uh, in short-term rental. So just, you know, you, you have to do your own due diligence. You, you, you're going to be your own best advocate uh, with your tax position. It's great that you're listening to this podcast and educating yourself um, because honestly, a lot of CPAs, unless they're doing this and not just CPA, sorry, a lot of tax uh, preparers, unless they're doing real estate full-time, they're probably not fully aware of these rules. So you need to, you, you need to educate yourself on how it works. And, and you should check out what Tom was just talking about, about the courses and stuff. We put out a lot of a lot of content around all these tax court cases and the litigation because we don't we don't like to see people get caught up in um you know just just in situations where they can't win um so just be careful that that's it just be careful yeah your your uh, website's amazing therealestatecpa.com uh i encourage everybody to check it out encourage everybody to subscribe to their youtube um i i watch it on a weekly basis when I'm on the treadmill, um, if you're into the taxes and you're into saving money, because as I found after practicing for almost 20 years, there's nobody that's going to be looking out for your money more than yourself. And, and I'm not telling you to go out and do your taxes yourself or go out and be your own advisor, but like Brandon and Tom, were talking about educating yourself enough to when you do meet with people, you can, ask questions and smart questions when they start telling you what you need to do. And I wish I'd have done that early on my, in my career because I've been screwed over many times, like many people probably watching this as well. So that's why I am out seeking out people that know what they're doing, ethical people that can help us on our journey to paying as little tax legally as possible. So uh, guys, I want to thank you again for your time and uh, looking forward to taking the short-term rental course myself.